Welcome to another episode of Twice Told Tales podcast. Today we have a guest, Aria, and we're going to talk about the uh, recent uh, uh, spate of supposed poisonings of schoolgirls in Iran. Um, it's an interesting conversation about mass psychosis and how that affects different cultures. So uh, welcome to the show. Yes, thank you very much. In the name of God, my name is Arya. Thank you for uh, inviting me on this show. I'm very pleased to be in, on this show. Oh, well, you're most Thanks. welcome. Where are you joining us from? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm from Western Uni Europe. Oh, okay. You're in yeah. Western Europe. Can you give us like a little background so people know sort of like where you're coming from on the issue and then we'll just get into it. Yeah, so basically I'm a, a student uh, studying pharmacy and uh, in my free time, uh, I do uh, research and writing um, because, well, I'm an, I'm an Iranian, but uh, I have uh, lived and grown up here in my entire life. Uh, and it saddens me to see that there is a lot of disinformation about my country. So uh, I try to research and debunk the lies that are being spread about my country. Oh, well, that's, that's great. I feel the same way about America, so <laughs> I mean, maybe it's not the lies about America, but the lies that America makes is uh, sort of I'm I feel motivated in the same way to criticize power. You live, you live in the factory, so yeah, the factory <laughs> of information, or one of the one of the main three. One parts. of the main factories. That's true. Yeah, so, that's true. Uh, it's not the only. So, yeah, maybe Satari, you could like introduce the the issue like what came about and then we can get into it like what is what are yeah. what happened so yeah so uh, it started with the news that a few um high school like girls high school uh in rome were uh reporting uh girls being poisoned and taken to hospital uh but for very like kind of minor issues like the none of them ended up being actually hospitalized uh, for a long time, it was just a few hours and they had the checkup and everything and then uh, were, were back home. Uh, and it started with the conversation that there are, uh, well, this is what I, would, what I was reading uh, online, that they were actually like, um, um, like saying that this was something similar. Uh, to what was happening in Afghanistan under Taliban, that they are uh, banning girls from going to school or something like Boko Haram, where in Africa, where uh, like schools going to school is uh, considered haram for some girls. But personally, I thought I have never, ever seen in, from the most conservative Iranians to the most liberals that anyone who is actually against sending there's their girls to school especially that we have all girls school and it's not really an issue so the story started with one or two reporting schools and then it developed into a lot more and then it wasn't only home which is you know uh, considered as a religious city it went to other cities and a lot more cases were reported um and um suddenly was top news everywhere um, I think, Arya, by now, the government has concluded what has actually been happening, right? Yeah, so basically, uh, you have explained it, you have explained it uh, very well how it began. So uh, this whole uh, incident happened with uh, around the end of November in Gom, uh, and it quick, quickly spread across the country from Ardabil to Tehran uh, to Luristan. Uh, where schoolgirls uh, fell uh, some uh, minor illnesses like uh, feeling nausea, dizziness, uh, faintness, and um, I mean, in my opinion, it's 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 very crucial to first dissect the Western narrative that it's been uh, playing uh, on this issue. Uh, for example, the Guardian called it a retaliation for protests against hijabs in the country. Uh, wow. They are. I that. <laughs> oh my God. It's, it's oh very my absurd. God. Yeah, I didn't see that one. 
it's 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 very oh absurd, God. but they're really uh, pushing this narrative, and they are indirectly, and some of them directly accusing the Islamic Republic for poisoning uh, the schoolgirls. Uh, I mean, oh as my. absurd it's it sounds. I mean, wow. there are also there are also pro Islamic Republic girls that are that were affected by this. So, uh, I mean. When you when you see that there is uh, there's one organization that is funded by the Islamic Republic uh, called the um, the the Barakat uh, organization, they build 220 schools per year, uh, and so to put it more in perspective, as of 2023. Uh, in in the United States, uh, with a 336 million population, they have about approximately 128,000 schools, private and public. And then, when you compare this number with the 87 million populated Iran, they have one uh, a 110,000 amount of schools as of 2020. So it really, it, it sounds very absurd to even accuse, to even think that the Islamic Republic is uh, responsible for um, this incident. Well, it's just like with the recent unrest, like every time they make it, I mean, they accuse Iran of these things that would be so counterproductive for Iran to actually be doing. And so if you even, that's one of the reasons why I mean, just looking at the propaganda, and they do it with all the, they do it with Palestine too. It's just like, you, if you're just a rational person, and you're thinking, well, why would they do that? They excuse that in the media, like, oh, because it's an irrational dictator who just does irrational evil things. But that doesn't actually exist in the world, because if that ever happens, that's, people don't tolerate that very long. So, like, the idea that the Iranian government would just be, randomly poisoning schoolgirls and not coming out with like a fatwa or something that says oh this is bad and this is why you're being poisoned that that would be really a legitimate like like thing for a, a government to do to be like i mean it would be insane but it would be like at least you would be accomplishing a fear campaign because you'd say you know if you protest again we're going to poison you all and if you had a government that was stable enough to do that i guess that would work obviously the iranian government is already struggling with the you know instability so to make it like they're killing their own citizens is just it just i don't know it's and and in a country not like we're doing it for this reason it's just like we're yeah. These girls are dying, and we're just going to let the Guardian tell everyone why they're dying. <laughs> like, we're not going to take for it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and the thing that, like, I mean, in Iran, like, uh, more than 50, or something around 57% of college students are girls. How does, I mean, if if the exactly. uh, Islamic Republic wanted to stop women for from going to school and university, they would definitely start with the universities. And someone can argue that I mean, like, if you want to consider some uh, very, very extreme religious groups, they would start again with the university because that's where uh, like girls and boys attend together. But schools, high schools here are sep- separate, uh, segregated. Uh, and so, I mean, I could imagine that you would say that there is a group of very extreme people that want, that don't want their, for example, daughters or other girls to go to school, but it, even that, I have never, as I said, I have never seen any, any, um, like anything like that from even the most conservative people that they wouldn't want their, because this is something that Islam preaches and everyone is talking about. They take pride in sending their daughters, like even the most religious ones, they take pride in sending their daughters to school and to college and that they have uh, some great academic achievements. And it's it's actually very competitive and everyone wants to be a part of that. So it's, and you have a it PhD, makes absolutely no clear. sense. You're speaking as a woman in Iran who has a PhD <laughs> earned in Iran. Yeah, so you have, a, you have experienced the full educational food chain there. So you know yeah and and most and most of my friends are had to ha- have at least the uh, master's degree <laughs> like not even exactly. a specialist degree well and also like so i don't i think first of all i mean i, I don't think anyone in our audience is you know n- 
probably, unless they're just tuning in to understand that the role and rights of women in Iran arguably is superior to a lot of Western nations. Um, and so it's it's always lumped in as if Iran is somehow like, I don't know, some a backwards nation that, you know, is like stuck in 1950s America where women were stuck in the house and like it's like no Iran is a modern country like what uh, I don't know what meme it was a press tv I think shared a meme the other day of like two women in the cockpit of an Airbus and it explained that these are two yeah <laughs> pilot and co-pilot are pilot. women and they they pilot an Airbus it's I mean I, it was a large Airbus I assume it's flying international flights so you know I don't know how many uh, all-female uh, cockpit teams there are in the U.S. Actually, I mean, I know there's probably a, a, there are a lot of female pilots. I've been on planes with female pilots, but I don't an all-female flight crew. That's pretty unique. Uh, and so, you know, women are professors, they're pilots, they're engineers, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they do everything in Iran. And and they probably have higher percentages in some of those fields than in the West. So um, yeah, yeah. I mean, sixty percent of university students are women in Iran. So that's about the same as in the U.S. too. So that's like that's that that stat is almost the same. There may be a few points different. It's definitely a majority in the U.S. too, uh, which is you know it's interesting because people are constantly crying about women's rights, but it's like obvious <laughs> that it's not that. Yeah, Nobody deal, but in Iran, also, the Iranians had a fir the first female vice president. The U.S. still hasn't had anyone in the executive branch who's a woman yet. We've only had male presidents and vice presidents, so, like, uh, until recently, and I, that one may be questionable. But, like, uh, you know, Iran beat us to that, so, uh, I don't, I don't know, it, it just seems that... I, if anyone wants to research it, they can look it on the internet. It doesn't make sense to talk about the status of women in Iran or actually the status of education. What I think is more interesting in this conversation is the actual psychology of it because yeah. it's something that is really important in current era, especially since like Matthias Desmet brought uh, mass mm. uh, formation, psychosis, or mass formation. He doesn't like using the word psychosis, but this ma mass group formation to the forefront uh, with COVID and how people all around the world sort of latched into this totalitarian structure very quickly. Um, I think this isn't exactly that, but it is part of that psychological mechanism that happens with humans. And when Satara first told me about this poisoning, uh, we were just talking about it and she mentioned it in passing and she said it was with young schoolgirls. And immediately I responded, I said, that sounds, is anyone actually dead? Is there any, actual poison that's been recovered because toxicology is very very good these days there's only a few poisons that can't be traced so like you know th that wasn't found so i was like it sounds like a group psychosis because this has happened in cultures around the world so maybe you could tell us about your how you when you first heard it your your experience in in researching it and how you came to your conclusion and maybe also some of the most outrageous uh um yeah. headlines that you read in other languages like english and other languages uh, online mm -hmm. like the one that you just mentioned by guardian yeah uh so basically uh, let me just give you one uh funny example as well uh, the time and uh, al jazeera actually also reported on this issue and they mentioned that one girl called uh, fatima rezai uh, died due to the alleged uh, between quotation marks chemical attack uh, but the funny part here is that uh, her brother came on Twitter and debunked this lie uh, and came and said that um, his sister actually died due to a, a way different illness and she didn't even attend school for three weeks. So uh, these all these reports are pretty much based on baseless claims and there are uh, there are assumptions brought as a, an, uh, a claim. But, um, you know, and, you know the, the, uh, the question uh, raises that why are they following, um, well, like, w what did actually happen? 
Uh, and this phenomenon is actually called mass cytogenic illness, MPI. Uh, it's also known as mass hysteria. Uh, and this phenomenon is a constellation of symptoms suggestive of an organic illness, but without an identified cause. So uh, in simpler words, it means that this dizziness, uh, the headaches, the fatigue, the faintness, uh, the girls are experiencing are very much real. They are actually there are actual illnesses. However, the cause is not poisoning, nor is there any toxic element involved. It's the thought that they might have been exposed to something dangerous, like a germ or a toxin, accompanied with an environmental trigger, like a bad smell or a, a rumor of exposure to a poison. Because um, uh, Iranian media, uh, they had published a, a video uh, where they interviewed a, a truck driver um, and the, the truck driver says in the video that he had parked his uh, truck next to a school and he admitted that he didn't close the valve of its uh, chemical truck properly and that made uh, that made uh, the, the, the release of a chemical smell and that could be uh, the trigger for one of those schools. And so it's also. Yeah. yeah sorry to interrupt you. It's also interesting. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think no teacher ever reported um, uh, symptoms. Is that correct? Like it was only uh, students. Teachers working at in the same schools never reported anything. I or actually, didn't need um, to be taken to hospital. I yeah, have so. read. Uh, somewhere uh, that uh, a few teachers were also um, affected by this, but um, it wasn't really something to highlight it. Uh, I mostly mm -hmm. read that it, it were, it were schoolgirls, uh, a few boys as well, but mostly schoolgirls. And I mean, right. it's very obvious because uh, there are actually scientific research that, uh, that talks about this phenomenon called MPI. Uh, and uh, it is proven that this phenomenon uh, mostly affects schoolgirls, uh, and uh, it's about 70%. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'd heard it before. And so when I heard this story, I was like, it's, and it's not, it's also cross cultural. Like, it's not just, it has mm -hmm. something to do with soci sociology, as a socio sociological or the psychological development of, of adolescence in a lot of companies. But, you know, there's been things like the Tokyo subway attack, which was really fascinating, where sarin gas was released. And it was like one line was affected by the sarin release in reality. But because the news covered it so broadly, like everyone in the subway system had symptoms. So you had people like, like having sarin symptoms around where there was absolutely no exposure. But it was just the psychology of hysteria. And those were not just schoolgirls. That was a broad swath of the population. So it's not just schoolgirls, but it happens commonly in school systems around the world in that age bracket. But it can it, everyone's susceptible to it. And that's one of the things where if you think about COVID and how the media pushed that narrative and that fear campaign, this is the same thing that was being uh, triggered, I think, in my opinion. like. Uh, yeah, for a lot of people. exactly. Yeah. And like you mentioned, the media plays a big role. Uh, for example, I'm going to give you another a good example to uh, really highlight this issue. Uh, in 1999 in Belgium, uh, there was an also an MPI outbreak where 26 children um, from one school, they developed the same symptoms like nausea, headache, etc. Uh, and they all um, they all admitted having consumed bottled Coca-Cola. And so they were admitted to the hospital, but uh, they were released after a few hours. And this incident was put under the scope of the media uh, with over dramatic media re reaction, which forced the company uh, Coca-Cola to uh, recall some of, some of its uh, salt drinks. But then after uh, a while uh, in other schools in different parts of the country, uh, similar incidents happened where girls were falling ill, uh, they, they had similar symptoms, but they were um, consuming different types of Coca-Cola drinks. 
And after a while, it was confirmed that there was nothing wrong with Coca-Cola drinks, but it was just the, the psychogenic illness phenomenon that played a role. And uh, the media was, um, I mean, th the same thing happened there. I mean, the media was accusing the company Coca-Cola for uh, having toxins in their drinks, uh, which costed them a lot of money. But then again, after a while, it, it was proven to be just a... Uh, an, mass hysteria yeah i can't remember which which country did this but people just don't understand governments do the cia definitely does understand the power of psychological suggestion because psyops are based on that but people i think generally should be more aware of how powerful their brain can manifest physical symptoms in them and to the point of killing them and you know matthias desmond gives a good example of like of strong psych, uh, strong hypnosis. Like if you're able to be, if you're someone who's who's very susceptible to hypnosis, you can be hypnotized to the point where they can, they have done open heart surgery on people, cut you open, crack your breastbone open, and manipulate your heart because the person couldn't, I guess, was they couldn't have uh, anesthesia. They were they, so they had to do this, and it works. And it, they were able to successfully do that without the person feeling pain because they're so so easily uh, taken to a different place in their world. And physically, their brain can manifest or deal with physical symptoms. Likewise, there's a there was an experiment. I forget where it was. Maybe it was Nazi Germany or maybe, I don't know. But it, I remember this story where they had a prisoner who was condemned to death. And he was used in a medical experiment in which they told him, look, we can uh, execute you, however it was, I don't know, firing squad or something, or we can just gradually drain the blood out of your body and you choose. And they let, the person chose, well, I'll just gradually go to sleep while you drain the blood out of my body. And so they set him up in an apparatus where he was thoroughly convinced they were bleeding him, like they had fake blood, they had dripping sound, they blindfolded him. And after a few hours, he died. And they didn't drip a single drip of blood out of him. They didn't take any blood out of him. It was just wow. the psychological conditioning to make him think that he was doomed. He was dying. Mm -hmm. The drips he heard were his end end of his life. And so, so it's very powerful the the what they can do with the media and messaging. I just want to make sure people understand that this is not this is not like oh how could it this could it be? no <laughs> mind over matter is really really a, a very powerful force in humans it's i mean it's a negative version of the placebo effect you know exactly yeah that's true that's true yeah so what what do you think came first do you think the do you think the mainstream media the western media who has targeted iran along you know the intelligence allied media do you think they just took advantage of a situation where there was a this this mass hysteria or do you think they were somehow involved with seeding social media with the stories to inspire this uh this you know because they have basically mind control over the entire youth with social media so do you have a feeling as whether this was like an orchestrated event or whether it was just taking advantage of a thing that happened um i think it's um to answer this question, we have to really uh, examine the timeline, uh, what happened uh, Iran since, uh, I mean, after the death of Mahsa Amini, uh, because after the death of Mahsa Amini, uh, Iranian, I mean, Iran was under a lot of uh, media pressure uh, from the Western world. Uh, I mean, it even pushed a lot of disinformation campaigns that are part of uh, hybrid warfare campaigns uh, against Iran, which uh, include disinformation, such as uh, a, a prime minister tweeting in a now deleted tweet that Iran is going to execute 15,000 yeah. protesters. I mean, this, of course, is going to put a lot of pressure on, I mean, the ordinary citizen in Iran. And so I believe that this did start as... Um, a, a mass cycle. All right, you uh, broke up again. Uh, and then the Western media. You just repeat yeah. your lesson. You did. 
mass psychosis you were saying. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so um, uh, I was uh, <laughs> uh, I was saying that uh, I believe that this started as a uh, mass hysteria because of that immense pressure from the Western media. Uh, and then it started as, uh, I mean, it, it continued as mass hysteria, but then uh, the West picked up this phenomenon uh, in Iran, and then uh, I believe they, they really misused it because uh, they started for the end of November, December, uh, and then Western media outlets began to report on it uh, began be, be, be in the beginning of uh, March. So, um, I mean, when was the first time was you heard about it? Because I think we heard about it. We talked about it maybe in the beginning of February, something like that. So, when was the first yeah, time? Yeah, you yeah same. Okay. Yeah, I did also hear it. But uh, in local, February, like if you I research say. in Farsi local media, you can find reports back in November. I think I also heard the first one in. Yeah. Uh, I read it on in one Telegram channel. Uh, which was actually describing it as something uh, being uh, perpetrated by by extreme uh, religious people back in maybe December or anything, but it was like one post, so I, I never... Like, so this may have been it. like part of the initial like PSYOP campaign that never really kicked off and it was like, it just ended up, it was like straggled into later. Because I can imagine if during the height of the protest, they were able to kick off this 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 uh, psychogenic illness or even actual poisonings by MEK terrorists or something that would have been extremely effective. So this may have been yeah. uh, something that was they hoped to have achieved in November, maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, that's true. yeah, uh, correct. But um, if we do have to keep in mind that um, around, uh, I think it was March 16, uh, that the Iranian media actually did announce that people were arrested who were responsible for uh, poisoning, well, between quotation marks, poisoning uh, a good amount of students in Laristan city. Um, and um, it, it, those five people, they were women and male, uh, and, and men, uh, and they admitted that they they sent their their uh, girls into the schools uh, and just to film, to record the, the storming out of these girls and to send it to uh, anti-Iranian media networks, uh, including Iran International, which is Saudi funded. Uh, and so I think that it is a little bit of a mixture of both mass hysteria and uh, deliberate attacks. Uh, but the deliberate attacks came really like late, late, like in March, they started to um, spur because so the Iranian media, uh, they reported that they caught those five people on March 16th, uh, that they were responsible for, uh, well, poisoning girls in Laristan city. And then those uh, poison cases were actually reported on uh, March, I think, 14. So it was like uh, two days before that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I could I could be off a little bit with the days, but uh, I remember that uh, the report of those five people that were arrested, those were responsible for the poisonings that happened two days before that. Um, mm -hmm. And and to um, to really I mean to give it a bit more it could, could have been a deliberate attack because um, the girls, uh, they tell that they smelled a uh, odor, odor. And um, the Islamic Republic news agency, IRNA, they reported that, uh, they, I mean, they suggested that there was uh, the use of ammonium. And it, and it makes sense because uh, there are uh, ammonium nitrate explosive devices that release nitrogen dioxide uh, and if you inhale nitrogen dioxide it could cause those same symptoms but uh, it's odorless and the reason so why need, nitrogen dioxide you know, is odorless uh, though, so it wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to yes, smell it uh, n2 uh, is odorless, it's just laughing but, uh, no, 
what they call it. They give it to you when you're at the dentist office. Yeah, but but they weren't reporting the smell. They were reporting uh, feeling like nausea uh, and stuff. And two, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, N2 is odorless, but uh, nitrogen dioxide could be uh, NO2. Okay, NO. Okay, so that would be. Well, how would that tie into a ammonium nitrate based explosive? Because uh, NO2 could be a. Um, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, but no, well, but where is the explosive? It could be, like someone also has, there's also now a bomb involved? That's what I'm trying to understand. Uh, this is pure okay. speculation. I mean, I'm not saying that sure, they sure. use explosive devices. So it could be one of the reasons. Uh, because, I mean, uh, Irna said that, uh, I mean, they suggested the use of, of ammonium. And so when you um, set on fire ammonium nitrate, it could uh, release nitrogen dioxide and um, when you uh, inhale nitrogen dioxide below 2 ppm uh, parts per million uh, this could uh, cause some uh, unpleasant feeling inside you like uh, dizziness but uh, it's not d uh, live dangerous it's not dangerous to uh, to the point that it will kill you uh, it won't uh, have any changes in your blood chemistry, which uh, which also explains why they haven't found any toxins right. after a, a test results. But how would these uh, like enter the schools? Yeah, how would this? Um, how would these like? Like I mean, the speculations. Burning do they ammonium have... nitrate enter the school? Uh, those like, do they have that... a? Yeah, yeah those ahead. girls could have, um, I mean, smuggled those, um, I don't know what, what they are, but those ammonium nitrate uh, explosive devices. It's, it's not like a bomb or something. It could be just something that they throw in a corner and the, those fumes. Uh, oh, so you're basically trying corner. to speculate on how they could have created a non-traceable uh, gas that would have affect the girls. Well, that... That's one option, but I guarantee you there's way less complicated and less visible ways of doing it. I mean, even with the, even these guys, the Tokyo subway attack, they created like rice and nerve gas basically out of their apartment. So you can you can create horrible, un, unsensible toxins because ricin is you can't smell it. I think it's odorless also, and it's a terrible nerve agent. So I I agree with you. It's possible that someone's doing terrible things because we know the MEK and everyone has their targets on Iran but I don't know if I don't know if it's even valuable to speculate on the mechanism because there are so many I mean I think the CAA probably has yeah like of course a thousand different options to do this is just trying to uh add it's just a speculation to add yeah. to, the, to the report mm -hmm. why those five people were arrested I mean it could right. be that because uh, if we see back uh, with the MPI case in Afghanistan, where uh, schoolgirls in Afghanistan were affected uh, with this so-called uh, poison, which wasn't actually poison, um, um, Western media uh, outlets reported um, girls or, or, or other people getting caught uh, for having allegedly a hand in this poison, which later after a few years after, after a few years it was proven that they weren't actually responsible it was just a a, a psyop so i yeah, mean yeah that's what i i would yeah. guess too that possibly the arrests are simply a reaction to the disbelief that this is a, this is a psychological condition like because i i even have friends in iran who still who are you know intelligent people and very aware of everything and who's still tend to think that this is a genuine case of poisoning or these are genuine cases of poisoning. So like, I think the disbelief in the, cause people always discount their, like the effect that your brain can have on your body. Like it's so, most people, when they hear a story like that, they'll be like, oh, I would never happen to me cause I'm too smart for that or whatever. <laughs> but it's like, that's not, that's not how social conditioning works in people. You can manifest, 
these things can be manifested in populations and especially in susceptible populations. And I think there's important cross-cultural examples of this where in a lot of cases it's poisoning, but I think in the West currently, one of the things that is very much this is the, or it's reflected in the, and very tragically in the transsexual, the transgender phenomenon that's happening because You'll see in case a lot of cases where a school system you'll have like like one school there'll be like a bunch of girls will all say that they their gender whatever I mean maybe they're not saying they're boys but they're saying there's some gender confusion issue and that's because there's so much pressure on social media and so much everything to be like questioning and when one girl does it they all kind of do it because the, the conformity the the pressure for young adolescent girls to conform as a group is really high, whereas with boys, it's not quite like that. So that's why it affects girls a lot, because it's, there's this constant like fighting between girls for everyone to be in this like same. Like there's this very conformist thing. I don't know. I don't understand it. It's like I'm not a girl, um, and I'm not planning on being one. So like I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I think I think that trans transgender phenomenon in high schools and young uh, people is there's a lot of reflection of mass hysteria um, and you know that's obviously very taboo to say that because people don't understand but I think this is there's cultural ways this manifests that are 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 significant and are outside of the poisoning phenomenon we have um, yeah so uh, I think I the think governments the rest of the five guys may have been just a complete n not able to deal with the fact that this could be psych psychological and they need culprits. So they, they may be later released and found innocent or whatever. But just because arrest, they arrested doesn't uh, mean they're guilty, right? Or no, been, but, that, yeah. but that's not the case. The thing is, it was a combination of a lot of things. At like the government reports, uh, Arya, please also comment on what I'm saying and if um uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, the government reports is says that it's a combination of a lot of them. So a lot of these things were actually like totally uh, some mass hysteria. Like there was no trigger, there was no actual trigger or anything. It was just someone because they were constantly hearing it on the news. They felt the same thing and they started reacting, and everyone else started reacting. In other cases, some of those students wanted to be naughty and they, uh, you know, they used uh, those like sprays or things that smelled bad only yeah. to uh, start that, you know, it was uh, totally funny. out of curiosity. Yeah, it was totally out of curiosity and like they, the students and their families have been talked to and they were just, uh, you know, a arrested. reminder and yeah, they were not arrest arrested or anything. There were also, um, like um uh, like cases where there was actually something that the the teachers and the students smelt. Uh, so some of them, as I said, were students smuggling things to just out of curiosity and things. But some of them, uh, it looks like there were actual attempts. Uh, and these these are the people who were arrested. Like one of the uh, families, the, like the uh, I think the entire family was involved. Yeah. Sorry. Exactly. Uh, so it was like Are a plan. Are they affiliated they were, with MEK? These people? Uh, they were. I don't think they were affiliated by MEK, but they were uh, asked to film the thing and do it, and then we, they would be paid when they sent oh, it to. Oh, just like uh, just, just like uh, uh, our former guests talked about, <laughs> right? And how uh, they're uh, Dr. Tajik. Uh, yeah, but what, I mean, which case are you talking well, about? She, she wrote that whole article about how foreign intelligence agencies were like oh, telling yes. people to do things and film them and then pay them money. Yeah, yeah, so, it was it it was a big part of the the whole campaign that started from September. Just go on the street, toss up someone, some random clergy's uh, turban, and film it and send it to us, and we will pay you. Send you Bitcoin, yeah. right? Exactly. Wow. So that so that okay. So they these these farms of CIA guys on their cell phones could have like 
orchestrated a continuation of this phenomenon, or they could have started it, but they could have just, they wanted to keep feeding the fire by getting these dupes to, to yeah. poison things and film it. Okay. Okay. Yes, because, but, you know, um, part of the, the psychological operations uh, from uh, of the U.S. is to create skepticism and instability towards the government. And, and so, you know, th that's why they filmed these things and uh, sent to uh, anti-Iran uh, media networks. And they, yeah. they tried very hard to cancel schools, and I'm very happy that the Iran did not uh, allow that to happen because like they were trying very hard to say like schools are dangerous and you have to cancel schools and you could see online a lot of uh, these trolls saying why aren't you just why don't you just stop going to school when you see that schools are not safe why just why don't you just stop sending your kids to school because they really wanted to ca uh, cause more chaos and the government did not allow for that. They they kept the schools open and they just tried to take care of everything. So so like there wouldn't be a mass closure of schools and especially that we had the Nuru's ahead and you know as we get close to the new year, everyone wants to cancel schools and there was this <laughs> vibe uh, in the air that everyone wanted wanted to skip classes and everything, but they didn't didn't let that happen. And I'm very happy that they didn't. Because it was basically it's not nothing. I mean, I, I I totally understand that parents were worried because they needed an explanation and everything. But it was totally safe. And and I I also know uh, like students who didn't even hear anything about that. They were totally clueless about what was happening until there was like mass reports on media and the have with the hashtag like chemical attacks or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But that's was, like, that's good terrible. actually. That's that's good that there is an ability to to you know avoid that because that means there's some resiliency when it comes to Western psyops because like there isn't full permeation like here in the U.S. I don't think it's like that I think if something happens and it's like that everyone knows about it. like it's immediately the entire country mm -hmm. is programmed like yep. so that's good that there are some students who aren't on social media, Western yeah. dominated social media. Yeah, and I live near some schools and I didn't hear anything um, being reported, no cancellation, uh, just everything going on. You know, one thing I, that, I, yeah, sorry. No, go, ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, one thing that um, the Western media is really a professional at is uh, making something very s small look very big, like also with the protests that happened yeah. in Iran, they made like it maybe like fifty people came uh, together and they protested and they ma made it look look like it was ten thousand people. Yeah. yeah, and how many you know of those that I got... people had their phone like directly connected to the CIA and was. <laughs> they didn't know it for people to come out yeah. on the street, right? So it it used to be it used to be very dangerous to say that uh, when the protests started. You know that, like if you said that there were only like a hundred people or something gathering and not thousands and thousands of people on the street, you would get, come under a lot of attack online. I mean, that's how they uh, how they controlled the narrative. You had death threats against you. That's what you're. That, that's that what. That's what happened. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't only me, but yes, yeah, but I got death threats for just saying that. Yeah. On on Twitter, I'm getting weekly death threats because of these um, narratives that I'm debunking, uh, and it's really funny. I mean, yes, it's true. You know, some some Iranians inside Iran are against the Islamic Republic. Come outside. Uh, um, a, uh, I don't know if I'm, I saw that the Iranian journalist Feresh Sadiqi was also on uh, your show. Uh, she reported that there were approximately about 17,000, 18,000 uh, rioters together. Uh, but, you know, to compare this to the, Iran to the entire Iranian population, the Iranian population who came outside in 21 million uh, strong on uh, 21 Bahman on the on the anniversary yeah. of the uh, Islamic Re Revolution. I mean, 
I don't think she it's, said it's, seventy thousand. No, I don't she, she, she said it in a, in, in a in a comment on Twitter. Oh, oh okay. I could, I could, right. I could send yeah, it to you. Yeah, because on our show, did yeah, okay. Yeah, I thought you were talking about the discussion discussion that we had with her because she was also saying that it wasn't big at all. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's the thing, the hyperbolic uh, representation of what is happening inside Iran. And sometimes and in this round of propaganda, a lot of times just making uh, f- totally fake uh, headlines. Uh, I think people can read, um, like Chris and I wrote an article for Grey Zone where we debunked just just a little bit of uh, what was actually happening. I think we, we selected a few uh, really outrageous headlines that were published by BBC, uh, CNN, and um, some um, like celebrities with uh, millions of followers, and how they were all just uh, lies. Like it did, like there wasn't an actual thing happening, and then uh, they like exaggerated. In a lot of cases, there was just nothing happening, and they just made up things and. You can get away with any lies that you say about Iran. That's how um, crazy it can get. And but that's because the primary target of the propaganda isn't Iranians. It's the Western public because they're because they're the ones that need to pay the money. Because this is just it's every every event that happens now in the world. Every major event is just a scam of the Western taxpayer at the expense the of the lives of of other people. The psychology of other people and the you know and the future of, of Western governments because or people because their tax money is just totally being grifted by these large scale military operations and this is just this isn't thankfully a large scale military operation but it is the precursor to something like that and that's what they hope and so they're they want to prime the West to think that there's this great evil that they need to pay up to solve in Iran. And so, uh, you know, and the sad thing is there's so many expat, expatriate Iranians that live like all over the world who, because of the way the history of Iran with the coup and the revolution uh, happened, you have people who feel allied to Western capitalist interests, and they think that the people's revolution was wrong, just like in Venezuela and Cuba, you have expats who who are are very much geared towards hating their own people's democracy. And uh, uh, yeah, so they have the, all these people are repeaters and then confirmers for the Western public. Like, it, it, you know, if you run into an Iranian in the U.S., it, <clears throat> chances are they're gonna agree with american policy on iran like that definitely but yeah yeah so. unfortunately that's true yeah so are you in what western else? europe oh uh, do you find it many iranians there that are like because i i've never had that experience in europe finding an iranian who understands iran <laughs> uh well having lived here in europe i don't really um talk about politics uh, with my Iranian uh, friends here because, well, you know, I I'm, I al- already know uh, what they will say. Um, and so talking with logic, talking with sense with them, it's really a, a waste of time because they will just repeat what they hear from Iran International uh, and you will tell them that the sky is blue, but they will dis- disagree with you. So. Um, <laughs> To be honest, I haven't really met a, uh, a in, an Iranian here in Europe. Uh, I mean, I, I know that there are a few because I uh, I know them from social media, but to have them met mm-hmm. them uh, personally, uh, I, I don't think so. It's rare. It's like a unicorn. Yeah. yeah. It's very rare, yeah. Yeah, that's true. So- so are there any other issues in Iran that you're 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 working on currently with your Twitter account? Yes, uh, I have I have actually written an article for Al Mayadeen recently, uh, where I discussed that the uh, the protests uh, against the Iranian government uh, in in Europe um, that 
not all of them are actually out of hatred towards the government. And, and it's mostly because people here in, in Europe, uh, um, Iranians, uh, they are at, they are seeking for a residence permit. And the, asyl mm -hmm. the asylum case uh, system here in Europe is very strict. It's very uh, difficult to get into. Uh, and it's also very costly uh, financially wise. And so they resort to uh, easier ways in, uh, to, to get their asylum, asylum uh, case accepted. And one of the easiest way to get your residence permit uh, is to uh, join and, and attend these anti-Iranian uh, uh, protests and to show yourself in front of the camera, to take pictures, uh, to even uh, at, m do some interviews. Uh, this will really strengthen do your, they, your... Do they like submit the videos and photos to the government with their visa application? Uh, no, I mean, they have to be uh, in Europe for the, uh, the the case, I mean, when you when you enter Europe as an as an, as an um, asylum see seeker, uh, you have to prepare a testimony case, and in oh, that okay. testimony okay. case, you have to prove your yeah your arguments, your reasonings why you are uh, you why you can't return back to Iran. Uh, oh and right, so, right. Yeah, and so and so attending these protests will strengthen their claim. Uh, if they were going to re Iran, uh, the Iranian government will arrest them. Exactly. Like I knew, I knew that's, a guy that's in, what they claim. in Northern Europe who was who successfully got asylum and, and well paid because he said he was gay and he couldn't return to his country of origin or they would kill him. And that worked for him. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There's also cases yeah, where point. Iranians are uh, converting from their religion to Christianity, for example, uh, also as an, uh, a way to get their residence permit. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like it's the Soviets did to convert it to Judaism to move to Israel. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but probably when these people, when they got to uh, Europe, they didn't have to show that they're actually practicing the religion or any sign. Like the ones who claimed that they were gay, um, I know. I would love that would be great if there was like a <laughs> you had to prove it. <laughs> they knew the current lingo of the whole transgender nonsense. They can just call themselves queer because apparently <laughs> you can be queer and you can still totally functionally be a straight person who's attracted to the opposite sex and does everything normal straight people do. But you're no longer just a straight person. You have like a new label because you want to be a cool straight person. So they call themselves queers. So if you just call yourself a queer, I'm sure they could also do the whole thing and be like, well, I can't go back if my country doesn't like queer people. But you <laughs> say you're queer, you don't have to go through the whole, like... That's true. Yeah, so true. they should yeah, they study just up on the smart. terminology and they can get away with just exactly. some word games. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I guess we can wrap it up. If uh, Arya, if Great. you have anything to add, um, it was a great conversation so far, so if, if yeah. there is anything you want to add, please do so. Uh, yes, I really enjoyed the conversation as well. I, I do have to add that this was my first time that I'm doing such, uh, well, talking or podcast. So, uh, <laughs> and you were great. Um, that was, a, good, that was a, a great first one. Thank you very much. It was a very great experience for me as well. And uh, I'm really grateful for uh, inviting me. Uh, to your oh, show. well, you're welcome back. So if you have any new interesting yeah. topics that you, like, you want to talk about this uh, new uh, thing you're working on about asylum or uh, please, like, <laughs> we just like having interesting conversations with people who are curious and trying to understand the world. So thank great. you very much. Great we'll, to meet we'll you. Do. Yeah. Thank so Arya much. is also very active in informing the world about what's happening inside Iran because he knows Farsi. It's makes it uh, it easier for him also to like monitor everything that is happening we will make sure that we add your uh, twitter handle and also your Thank article you. on uh, my idea will uh, link it to this uh, interview so that people can read it thank you very much thank you very much most welcome okay so all right well thanks for everyone for joining us on another episode of twice told tales and we'll see you again soon <laughs>